from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Seattle for KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2018. Cube's live coverage, three days, day one of a full house event here, 8,000 people doubled from last year. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. Our, our next two guests are from Red Hat. Great to have these guys as uh, our guests. As also, thank Red Hat for being great sponsors. Brian Redbeard Harrington, Cube alumni back, product manager of service mesh at Red Hat, and William Oliveria, product manager serverless at Red Hat. We'll hear a lot about that. Guys, first of all, thanks for coming on and thanks to your company, Red Hat, for being a great supporter of theCUBE and the community, the contribution you guys have helped us make. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely Happy to be here. delighted to be here. All right, so let's get into it. So service meshes are hot because now Kubernetes mm -hmm. is kind of like we're seeing that, that it's totally stabilized. And now you're starting to see the engineering and the value creation happening in, in layers, shim layers they call it here, we got stateful applications. So you're starting to see service meshes mm -hmm. conceptually adopt. Give us a quick update on where that is, how real is it, what's the progress, and what's some of the state of the art activities around it. Well, the, the beautiful thing is that using a service mesh is not anything new at all. I mean, that was really built atop uh, the Netflix OSS ideas. You know, they've been around for you know, seven, eight years now, and kind of, it's really just kind of decomposing what were a bunch of individual libraries that you had to implement into more infrastructure services so that you know that you just, regardless of the language, environment, et cetera, you've always got a certain base platform ready to go. Is service mesh going to be a, a standard thing? Is it going to be you know, service meshes of your flavor? Is there going to be certain instances, custom service meshes? How do you see that coming out? We see Istio, Knative, is things evolving. Mm -hmm. They what, are. What's, what's the state of there? Is it going to be, that's going to be the new normal or is it going to see settling? What's your view on, on that? I think to some extent it depends on the scale that you're at. You know, if you are at the scale of, you know, Yelp or Stripe, you know, one of those, and using Envoy, you already have a good idea of what that mesh is going to look like, so you're building that control plane in the way that you need it. Where uh, Istio and Linkerd and some of these other ones come in is when you are at the smaller scale and you need to figure out what your control plane is going to look like, that's where it really shines because it gives you something that you can just start using and, and has a, some training wheels on it to make sure that you've got the, uh, a stable platform to use from day one. So one of the other news items today I wanted to get your opinion on is etcd has been handed over to Linux Foundation and CNCF. Mm -hmm. So uh, etcd came out of uh, CoreOS, of course, mm -hmm. which was acquired uh, uh, by Red Hat. Uh, give us a little bit of the update as to why that happened and uh, uh, you know, why it's a good thing for the community. So I think for any stable platform, you know, it's really been the theme of kind of what I've been talking about, you've got to know that it's safe to use the software, that there's going to be a longer term uh, vision and a lot of community guidance around that, and that's why Red Hat made the contribution. You know, when we were at uh, CoreOS, we really wanted to, and it was something that you know, was ultimately a goal, but it, it kind of became a little bit of a race condition. Yeah. Do we go ahead and contribute it and then hope that other folks will join us in building it? Just by open sourcing it, you know, we saw some contributions from IBM around PowerPC architecture and you know, uh, Mesos and other groups coming in, but putting it just full bore in the CNCF really guarantees that there will be ongoing community collaboration. Just to give a shout out to you guys at Coros, you guys did an amazing job, and I think this is a benefit of the Red Hat relationship because mm -hmm. That's yeah. the startup dilemma you have. Do we get it in there as an answer? How do we support it? How do we make it better? Is it competitive? What's our focus? What do we optimize it for? But now we're on, with the Red Hat piece, you guys can lean back and do the right thing and get it in there with the right resource push. Is that kind of how it, it's evolving? Because that seems like what's... It, it absolutely is. And you know, the, this goes beyond just etcd. You know, the, the really rad thing is that I think it's safe to say that there is no part of the CoreOS portfolio that really isn't getting open sourced. And you know, you can kind of read into yeah. that what you will, but it meant that there was no technology that was getting left behind, and that our users who really felt passionately about pieces of software, again, were going to be able to have that yeah. utility. Yeah, no, I, I think it goes back, uh, you know, we, we, we've been at Red Hat Summit for many years, and Red Hat is 100% open source, it must be. Yes. And even I, I go back to Polvi and yourself and Brandon, mm -hmm. all of the tools that CoreOS were, were creating is they were all going to be open source tools uh, mm -hmm. that you will be involved in. I guess, William, a good point to bring you into the conversation. Okay. Serverless 
and fully open source have not been, you know, how, how you've thought about it, at least uh, for the last uh, right. couple of years. So, uh, you know, before we get into the Knative, give us kind of the, the Red Hat positioning, where does serverless fit in the architecture, and then, you know, we'd love to tease out all the Knative discussion. Absolutely, yeah, I guess for us, serverless then is it's a lot about the user experience and how we can simplify how developers can leverage technologies such as Istio and service meshes and everything around the developer experience on top of Kubernetes, right? Serverless can deliver that, and a lot of what we believe is that you should not be then tied too much to functions because we can do that for functions, but we can do that for any class of applications actually running on top of the platform, right? And that's a lot of why we, we believe that Knative is, is this powerful, interesting project going on right out, out there right now. And we already, we already have all these different players collaborating, which is fantastic for interoperability. We make sure that we can leverage that implementation on different platforms. We can run that anywhere pretty much on top of Kubernetes. And, and that's a big goal to, to make sure that you can plug all these different parts as part of a consistent user experience there. Okay, so we, we had theCUBE at the Google event uh, this summer when it was announced. I was at Serverless Comp this year, and to be honest, a lot of people were kind of scratching their heads trying to understand. It's like, okay, Serverless and Kubernetes are going together, but I'm not sure I quite get it. Give us the update, you know, where are we? <laughs> you know, when does this get baked into platforms? You know, what, what, what can I do today? Where do I learn more? Right, so yeah. today what we are offering is, uh, I would say, the, the three big modules as part of Knative are build, events, and, and serving, right? So it's the basic capabilities for you to build a serverless platform that can, again, work on any, any kind of application, not only functions. And uh, we are at that stage. Uh, the project is very new. We are still in 0.2 release at this point. So there is a lot of missing parts around user experience and whatnot, but we are getting there, and that's where most of the focus is going on right now. But with uh, something like events, like that's a perfect opportunity, for example, to integrate with all the different services we have uh, available, let's say on service catalog or through the operator's framework, for example, to connect to the applications that we are building on top of Kubernetes. And it was missing, it, it, that was part of the things that, we, that was missing to connect the dots when you're implementing those applications, how you're going to consume events, how you're going to consume services, how those applications are going to scale. That's a lot of what we're addressing with Knative right now. What's the big walk away around the current uh, event here at KubeCon? We hear maturity, great, check. A lot of people find in their swim lanes or whatever, their value layer, check. Clear a lot more gaps, things, white space start to appear mm -hmm. when that visibility lifts. What do you guys see the opportunities for the community? And you guys certainly one of the big players, Red Hat leading the way. As this ecosystem is, is I mean, companies have never heard of coming out of the woodwork. This is vibrant. Yeah. There are opportunities for people to kind of play in these white spaces. You guys have any thoughts on where you could give guidance to where people could jump in and create value? Well, there's two areas that are really fascinating to me. One is the fact that now that Kubernetes has gotten to the level of boring infrastructure, it means that uh, there are a lot more companies that are really comfortable saying, we are building atop that, we don't care about what the compute layer is because we just know, and so you see a lot of uh, organizations that are coming in because they want to collaborate with other organizations and see how they're using it to cross-pollinate and get new ideas. You know, that's why you know, you've got full retail companies like Nordstrom here that are, you know, they're the local band in town and you know, they're, they're happy to come and show off. And you know, you've also got a lot of, uh, to the second piece of that, you know, emerging companies that are finding areas, you know, white space that we didn't consider as the kind of incumbents in the space. Um, and they're providing direct value. I think that, you know, as we have seen a lot more uh, acquisitions, you know, kind of coming through the space, um, there is going to be a lot of opportunity for the organization that has that five, 10, 50 million dollar idea to come in, build it quickly, know that it works on top of Kubernetes, and then be able to port it to enterprise software that runs on a local yeah. cluster or across clouds. So new business model innovations are coming out of it as well. Yeah. Right. And it's opportunities. It's okay to have a $50 million business. Yes. Not bad, and could be acquired as well, some other value mm -hmm. there. Okay, microservices are hard to manage. Guys, want, talk about this dynamic. This is one of the things you guys really work hard to address. I know we hear a lot about it. Porting to microservices, hey, I'm, a, I'm an enterprise. We should <laughs> move from our Red Hat Linux implementation to full cloud, and let's go, go all in on microservices. Well, what the hell is microservices? So again, this is kind of like, I'm not saying that they're thinking that way, but 
this is not that easy. Yeah. How do you guys yeah. make it easier? What are some of the, the, the speed bumps that customers hit? Mm -hmm. And what are those things to overcome them? What do you guys, what's your view on that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about, for example, how Knative is contributing to that. Again, the whole thing that we're talking about not being too tied to functions is because, again, I want to leverage the serverless capabilities available in the platform for microservices as well. And whenever you're talking about then monitoring, tracing, observabilities, Istio comes into play and again, solve that problem and connect all those different microservices in a very nice way. Uh, with Knative, since we can improve on the user experience, so you can do that in a very easy way, when you are coming from these brownfield applications, when you are migrating to the cloud, when you are trying to port those applications, it's a big learning curve. You've got to learn about all these different technologies, right? So if you can improve that user experience so you can do what you do best, which is focus on your code, and then we can take care of a lot of the complexities of building and wiring together all these different parts on the platform, we'll do that, and that's a lot of what we that's are doing with serverless. That's where the managed piece comes in, right? Right. Yeah. And then the monitoring, is that part of it too? Yeah, well, to kind of build on top of that, you know, there is the organizations that want to kind of still design things the way that they've been doing it, and we've had a big focus with a project called uh, Red Hat OpenShift Application Runtimes, or ROAR, which is kind of, it goes more in the direction of the past kind of concept, which, you know, was just a big difference between OpenShift and yeah. Tectonic, for example, and through that, um, a lot of the ROAR bundles for Python and Java and Node.js kind of integrate in the concepts of distributed tracing and Prometheus monitoring and things like that to make sure that you focus, again, to William's point, on building the thing that yeah. brings your business value mm -hmm. and standing on the shoulders of software at the infrastructure level. That's great stuff, and it's, and it's a lot more work to do. Yeah, just uh, last thing, I, I, I know Red Hat's been working on uh, just trying to, I don't know if you call it templatize, but how, how do I make it easier for people to just, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the, the name of the term for it. It's, yeah, so uh, it's the OpenShift application runtimes, yeah. you know, having what used to be the gear right. in the old OpenShift uh, realm, which is just, you know, here is a, a great template, a package to start from, mm -hmm. so that you can go in and implement the things that you care about and really step then into the, okay, we know that the code's going to work okay because we built that, we know the application platform is going to be predictable, we know that we have all of these additional hooks to manage it, so hopefully it lowers the bar to make it trivial to get started. That's awesome. Well, Redbeard, William, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Just a quick plug, what's up next for you guys? What's on the horizon? What do you guys, uh, what, what itch are you scratching these days? What's, what's getting you motivated? Uh, the big things that's exciting for me is, you know, the kind of forthcoming release of OpenShift 4.0, which gives me the room to shine on like the GA release of all the service mesh stuff. And then kind of in parallel, just a lot of the uh, like vector packet processing, uh, FIDO kind of high scale networking stuff is just sent a tingle up my spine. <laughs> I, I love paying, keeping an eye on that. William, yeah, what for you? me, we just announced the dev preview of Knative in OpenShift as an add-on, right? You can just install and run that on your OpenShift. And like Redbeard said, I'm looking forward for 4.0 as well <laughs> yeah. to make sure that I, I can plug that user experience on top of 4.0. And we are already doing a lot for uh, uh, the, yeah. the upside. I like to do that also now for developers as well. Well, when you're yeah. ready, we'll pop the digital cork on Twitter. Let us know. We'll mm -hmm. certainly cover it. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate the insight. Of course. Absolutely. The Cube course. here, bringing the insights and all the data here at KubeCon, Cloud Native. Of course, we're the Cube. Don't be confused with KubeCon. One of our conferences coming up. Fun, only kidding. We're not going to have that. Thanks for watching day one live coverage. Stay with us for more coverage after this short break.